A shocked Matilda no longer turns white. She instead turns quite pale. I don't understand. This isn't necessary. Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Brain Blaze, the show where one of my writers, in this case Danny, writes me a script I've never read it before, we're gonna read it together. It's called The Twits, The Roald Dahl Censorship Storm, and Other Reckless Revisions. <laughs> this sounds like a Danny title. <laughs> and Other Reckless Revisions. Uh, I don't know, this is the... And didn't they change, like, James Bond and stuff? And I always feel like these changes, right, where publishers change the book, so they're a bit more, like, up to date with the times. It feels weird to change stuff like this, because it's like, yo, the past was the thing. We all know it was shitty. <laughs> it's okay. Like, yeah, there were racial slurs. Yeah, there was, like, bigotry and all of this, like, that stuff in the past. And by changing it, aren't we kind of denying that? Which makes us like, no, the past was great, which I always say is kind of a bit shit. Like, you know, because... It makes you appreciate the present a bit less. Anyway, I don't know, maybe in my mind, I haven't thought about this a great deal. It always just strikes me as a bit weird. But then I also found out that, like, when the publishers publish these things, it's not like they're not publishing the original. They're just providing, like, a more, um, woke version for people who want a more woke version, which is also... That seems fine. The publishers own it. Like, the authors went into this knowing that they had a publisher and the publisher has control. So... Yeah, I don't know. That seems fair. That was a long, rambling introduction, <laughs> which has made people click off this video already. <laughs> ah, I'll summon you the worst YouTuber that's ever existed. Somehow, I don't know how you're successful. Okay, let's go. The legendary author Rodal once declared in 1982 that it'd be far from happy if anyone were ever to tinker with his work after his death. Yes, Rolled, but you also have a publisher and they get to make the decisions, Rolled. It's how it works. In fact, he said that if his publishers ever dared to tweak a single comma after he found himself on the wrong side of the grass, he would unleash the sizable terror of the enormous crocodile from beyond the grave to gobble up the offending parties. The late author is gonna need an even bigger crocodile. And by saying that, Roldal is acknowledging that, uh, he has no control over it. He's well aware the publisher is pa uh, the power his publisher has. And he's like, yeah, I mean, what can I do about it? That's what he's essentially saying here. Falling down and the faraway tree. We'll move on to Roald Dahl in just a moment, but I first wanted to mention a ridiculous revision which quite annoyed me when I recently stumbled across it. After writing her first children's book in 1922, British author Enid Blyton went on to write another 761 of the damn Holy sh**, Enid. You're like the children's author version of me. <laughs> Makes thousands of, I mean, obviously much more talented and famous and went down in history. I just mean in terms of, like, making lots of stuff. Don't get me wrong, I'm not comparing myself to Enid Blyton other than in production quantity. I think you're delusional and deserve to be picked down like a dog. Most of them were complete twaddle. Oh, okay. <laughs> I feel like I've read, like, maybe one Eden Bison book. I just assumed that they were good. But you can't really argue with a total of 600 million sales. Oh, my God. And a sale is, like, I've got a lot more than 600 million views. But, like, that's, a sale is a lot more than a view. Because a view makes me, what, like, <laughs> it's not very much money. But a sale probably makes a... I don't know. Quite a little bit of coin right there. Whether we're talking about the famous five... Oh, yes, this is what I've read... Yeah, these weren't very good. I never enjoyed these particularly much. There were other, like, I really enjoyed Roald Dahl as a kid. I really enjoyed Roald Dahl as an adult. He wrote some, like, incredible short stories. There's one about a brain in a jar, and some woman has her husband, her dead husband, or, like, you know, passed away, whatever. The husband, like, dies, and his brain is extracted and put in a jar and shit. It's fucking creepy. Like, Roald Dahl also wrote for adults, and it's dark. <laughs> Whether we're talking about the Famous Five, or the Secret Seven, or the Knobhead Nine, <laughs> a big chunk of... That last one didn't exist. A big chunk of Enid Blyton's books revolved around a bunch of young posh kids who got into awfully exciting adventures, and they went home for lashings and lashings of ginger beer served up by the housemaid. Oh, rather... <laughs> <laughs> but even though I never cared for most of Blyton's books when I was a kid, I did have a soft spot for the magic faraway tree. Never even heard of it, Danny. Can't believe I wasted all my time reading the Knobhead Nine. <laughs> These are books that really fired up my young imagination. A bunch of young posh kids. I get the feeling that Edith Blyton was probably a young posh kid, so she's writing what she knows. A bunch of young posh kids discover an enchanted wood with a magical tree inhabited by such fleshed out kooky characters as Moonface. He's got a round face. Saucepan man. He walks around wearing saucepans for a reason which I never adequately explored. Danny, is that real? Is that what really happens? What the f is going on, Enid? The faraway tree. 
Oh, is it faraway tree? It's not a faraway tree. It's faraway tree, which I feel like is actually a type of tree. So at least that's real. The faraway tree is so tall that it stretches up into one of many ever shifting magical lands. Okay, the faraway tree is not real. My bad. Most of the magical lands are happy, jolly places, but there are a few scary ones too, such as the land in which a violent old school teacher by the name of Dame Slap goes around slapping and poking little kids for no reason. Enid Blyton, did you write your books while you were high on like mescaline? Holy sh! I don't want to sound like I'm a future serial killer, but it's fun. <laughs> If you're not familiar with the magic faraway tree books, I'm not sure my description will have convinced you of their literary merits. Absolutely hasn't, Danny. <laughs> but they're certainly the only Enobliton books that I've still got on my bookshelves today. Are Enobliton books classics? Are they considered classics? I can't imagine the Famous Five is considered classic. But if someone was like, is Enobliton a classic author? I'd be like, yes. Yes, she is. Have I mentioned this previously? Maybe I mentioned it on my other channel. Bing, 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 bing. I was always put off classic books because of English. Like the subject that we learned at school, we had to read the most dreadful books that just I couldn't give less of a shit about. We read this book by someone called... Was the author Ethan Frome or is the book Ethan Frome? Whatever it is, it's shit. It's like, I just couldn't enjoy it. And it's just... Not the sort of book you want to read. And I was always like, classics suck, man. Like, this is just not interesting. And I was like, okay, look, I'm mid in my mid-30s now, 35 years old. Maybe you should give this another crack. So I started reading this book by a guy called Woodhouse or Wodehouse or whatever you want to, uh, want to pronounce it. And I'm like, it's great. And I moved on to, I read uh, The Old Man and the Sea by Hemingway when I was a kid. And I was like, I do remember enjoying that. Like, or as a, as a young man, like in my 20s. I remember really enjoying that. And for some reason, I just never read any more despite enjoying that. I'm reading The Sun Also Rises by Hemingway. It's fucking great. There's loads of great books from the past that I've all completely ignored because I just didn't like studying English at school. It's such a shame. I feel like English should be, like English literature should be a class that makes you want to read the classics, which are objectively good books. But I was just like, no, it's just a bit rubbish. So yeah. Uh, sorry, that tangent's not relevant, other than to say that I'm really enjoying, like, reading books from the past. <laughs> However, I'm only prepared to give precious shelf space to the vintage editions, as I've got no time for the modern editions, which were quietly revised at some point during the 1990s. Oh, yeah. So this video is supposed to be about revisions to books, and I realize we haven't actually talked about that at all yet, except for my pre-intro introduction. This, this video is just going to do terribly. <laughs> <laughs> what am I doing? For starters, Dame Slap is now called Dame Snap. No, you... What the fuck? You can She's called Dame Slap because she slaps people. What's she going to go around, like, be telling people off? <laughs> Just being like, you've been a very naughty boy, rather than actually slapping the kid. <laughs> Wait, is that actually what's going to happen? Please don't tell me that they actually rewrote. I understand, like, I don't think it's necessary or, like, necessarily a good thing, but... You can change words, but surely you can't be changing what actually happens in the story. Oh god, I just read the next line. Instead of beating the children silly, she just tells them off a bit. This is f***ing bullshit. I'm sorry, this is just nonsense. In fact, every single instance of comical violence, including a sequence in which Saucepan Man throws his saucepans at an army inv of invading goblins, has been trimmed from the books. Look, if we keep doing this, there's going to be nothing left in books, because we'd all know the past was the worst. But on a far more unforgivable level, the names of the kids have also changed. Two of the children were originally called Dick and Fanny, but they now go under the names of Rick and Franny. <sighs> Okay, I actually find that less egregious because children are children and they're going to be like, ah, his name's Dick, ah, her name's Fanny, Dick and Fanny, ah, which um, I feel could make kids snicker in class and put them off reading the books or enjoying the books and just looking at the silly names. By changing them, we're making the books more accessible to children. But by changing the actual story of the and removing the violence and stuff it, it it's like oh no 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 the past was wonderful children were never beaten the school teachers were never allowed to use canes on on children surely that just means children today like i'm pretty glad when i was at school they couldn't use a cane on me and i, I i'm aware of the past and i'm like that's great i'm glad we just had like minus house points <laughs> credits and debits 400 kajillion billion points from Gryffindor it's not even a real number whilst the word fanny has different vulgar connotations in the US and the UK it's always going to look a bit awkward next to the word d 
dick. And it seems that the publishers were keen to stamp out any giggles and sniggles from the readers and sniggers. Sniggers? Giggles and snickers. Isn't it snickers? What's someone like? What's that? That's like a snicker, not a snigger. What are you talking about, Danny? <laughs> <laughs> from the readership as they immerse themselves in thrilling new adventures of dick and fanny <laughs> but it does make... they had to change it it's funny their names are dick and fanny may as well just call them penis and vagina but it makes you wonder who exactly this was protecting it's just protecting the teachers from the kids just having a laugh in class the books are aimed at innocent children are probably too young to make any kinky connections no danny kids know the word dick <laughs> And they know the word fanny. It's still funny. And it's even funny because you, even if you don't know what it is, you know that it's something you're not supposed to know. And that's like naughty. Like, ah, ah, I don't know what that means, but I know it's naughty. Ah. It seems that the revision was intended to curb any cheeky chuckles from people who are too old to be reading the books anyway. I'm not happy about it at all until they show me the real dick and fanny again. This is hashtag not by Faraway Tree. <laughs> Start the movement, Danny. Hashtag not my faraway tree. It's not the only time that Blyton's books have fallen foul of the censors for questionable reasons. In the early editions of the Noddy books, it's implied that Noddy and Big Ears shared the same bed, but this was discreetly removed in modern reprints as suggests that it was a clearly unacceptable gay relationship between a wooden toy and a friendly hobgoblin. I say, um, no, it's also like, we also know in the past, it would be like, and how many people live in this one-bedroomed workhouse apartment? Oh, 700. And they're all in the same bed. It was the past. It was different. It's okay. It doesn't mean they're gay. That was weird, but not gay. You are. You are gay. And even if they are, haven't we gone like, I thought, okay, so they all peep. Two men sleep in the same bed in the past because it was like, well, yeah, there is only one bed and it's all we can afford and we're in the workhouse. And then that became unacceptable. There became multiple bed options and also gayness became less acceptable. But now it's like there are multiple bed options and gayness is acceptable. Aren't we back with it being okay? But it has to be admitted that much of Blyton's work is problematic today. Children are regularly spanked if they step out of line. Men and boys do all the important stuff while women just prepare smashing picnics and helpless girls are just there to wash up afterwards and anyone foreign is depicted as either being primitive dirty or untrustworthy <laughs> wait so we removed the slapping school teacher but it's like oh dirty foreigners <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. One of Blyton's most controversial works is a 1966 book called The Little Black Doll, in which a doll with blackface finds himself hated by his owner and all the other white dolls. <laughs> After, But again, but again, should we be filtering this? It's just the past. It's the worst. Like, obviously, there's still shit tons of racism today, which is, let's say, not awesome. In the past, objectively, there was more racism and it was worse. I mean, you want to go back further into the bars and it's like, holy sh**, dude. Like, the 1960s, I'm sure were bad. The 1860s, bro. The 1760s. F*** me. We don't need to change. We don't need to, like, sweep this under the rug. We need to look at it and be like, oh, okay. It's like, you know, sh**. We do some in some countries, it's illegal to sweep the Holocaust under the rug. And here we are being like, oh, we shouldn't have the one about the black doll hated by the white dolls because that never happens. <laughs> what are we doing? Why is this this double standard? After running away in distress, the doll gets caught in the rain, which washes his face and changes the color to pink, at which point everybody loves him again and welcomes him back into the vault. <laughs> Holy shit, Enid Blyton, though. <laughs> Perhaps there's some truth in the notion that certain books shouldn't be in print today in their original form, regardless of their popularity or place in history. Agatha Christie's And Then There Were None is the fifth best-selling book of all time. I've never heard of it! It's the fifth best-selling book of all time? Holy sh**. But the right decision was made to change the books from the original title, which ran along the lines of Ten Little Hipsters. <laughs> what? What's going on? What did that mean in the past? Although it was never published under the original title in the US, it was quite staggeringly published as Ten Little Hipsters in the UK right up until 1986. Wait. Wait, wait, wait. Danny, is this a reference to a previous video about Mark Twain and where basically the word hipster um, is also the N-word. Wait, is this- was this really book called The Ten Little Hipsters? Jesus Christ! <laughs> when was it published in 1986? 
Oh my god, I also don't know how I feel about that. And it's not my... I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Let, let, I'm just, let's carry on. So I think it's fair to say the certain revisions of the original text are fair enough, even though some British Agatha Christie fans may have felt outraged when the title was first changed after 47 years. Uh, look, it's okay. Like, some of this, some of these changes I'm not happy with. Like, I don't think that some of them are necessary. The slapping teacher, for example. Some of them I think it's totally okay. Like, changing this one is totally okay. Yeah. I don't know. Why, it's the slightest girl. You can be, I can have different opinions for different shit. It's fine. Yeah, well, you know, that's just like, uh, your opinion, man. But are old doll fans getting equally wound up over a logical decision? Or is it the publishers who have failed to read the room? Or is something else entirely going on here? A tale of the unexpected. How would you describe an Oompa Loompa? Um, short. <laughs> Red. Green hair. Is that an Oompa Loompa? I think many of us would immediately imagine a green-haired, orange skin, okay, orange, not red, originally hailing from the world of Lumpaland. No, I didn't know Lumpaland, but short would be one of the first things that came to mind, because they were all short, weren't they? That wasn't always the case, though. In the original 1964 edition of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, there was nothing fantastical about an Oompa Loompa at all. They were a tribe of black miniature pygmies whom Willy Wonka had captured and enslaved from the deepest part of the African jungle. No, he f***ing didn't. No! When was this? 1964! You can't be having slavery! <laughs> Willy Wonka! You're a f***ing slave owner! Holy shit, Willy Wonka! Following concerns this was hardly a positive depiction of people of colour, Dahl was later persuaded in 1973 to change from change the Oompa Loompas into fantasy creatures. I know this is incredibly stupid of me, but I didn't realise that Raoul Dahl wrote Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory. For some reason in my mind it was that Ian Fleming dude who wrote James B No, oh, he wrote Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. Yes, sorry. I just got those two mixed up. Yeah, Roald Dahl, okay, apparently. <laughs> Still feel like I wasn't, I wouldn't be 100% sure about that. <laughs> For a moment there I was like, yeah, Willy Wonka wrote Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory. <laughs> Why is he, your brain is so smooth. <laughs> Are you done? It seems okay for Willy Wonka to treat these creatures as cheap labor, though, as they only get paid in cocoa beans. But the point, at least they get paid. <laughs> but the point is that Roald Dahl's works have always had something of a revisionist history. And yet the new changes proposed in 2023 by the publishers Puffin Books appear to have caused a complete meltdown in the chocolate factory. Dahl's long list of books have sold over 300 million copies worldwide, but it was feared that his... How is Roald Dahl so... Don't... Uh, I guess because she wrote a lot more books, right? Like, I was just thinking he sold less books than Enid Blyton. And I feel like Roald Dahl's more famous, isn't he? I guess not. Hmm. But it was feared that his children's books may never quite read the same after Puffin announced that he was editing the material to make future editions more inclusive and accessible for a modern young audience. The vast majority of edits are rooted in the descriptions of the characters. So greedy golden ticket winner Augustus Gloop is no longer described as fat. He's now enormous. Wait, isn't that worse? <laughs> if someone said, Simon, you're really getting fat. I'll be like, dude, okay, chill, man. That's quite rude. If someone says, Simon, you're really getting enormous, I'll be like, dude, you could at least say fat, my dude. <laughs> <laughs> Any references to a character being ugly, weird, mad, or anything else vaguely unflattering has been given the chop. See, this just feels like too far. Okay, adjusting the book so that he's no longer a slave owner in the 1960s feels like if it was in the 1860s, then it would be like, okay, well, that's history. In the 1960s, it feels a bit like, bro, <laughs> no. And that's fine. I'm like, that seems like an okay addition. But being like we can't have people who are fat or like vaguely unflattering, mad, weird, ugly, this just feels like too far, doesn't it? I mean, I'm not having a meltdown over it. I just think it's like, did we need to do this? Mm. No. The Umbalumbas used to be exclusively male, but now they're gender neutral. Again, this feels too far. Like, I've got no pro- Like, if you want to be gender neutral, if that's cool, that's fine. I, like, I don't know. I just don't give a shit. Like, great. <laughs> great. I just generally think that people should be able to do whatever the f they want. But do we need to make- the, Do we need to go to a book in the past and then make the characters gender neutral? That, that I don't understand. Am I just an old man? Yes. Whilst the cloud men from James and the Giant Peach are now cloud people. Oh, I see. Wait, but just when you write a book nowadays, there'll be cloud people or may or, or cloud, right? Like uh, the one I always think about is is uh, Star Trek, where it's like to go where no man has gone before, and then in the nineties they were like to go where no one has gone before, 
And it's like, yeah, it updated with the time because it wasn't just dudes exploring space. And I feel like that's great. Okay. Although I guess Star Trek's fairly progressive. Very progressive. So I guess they were ahead of the time in the 90s, weren't they? I guess so. Because like James and the Giant Peach is 90. Oh no, James and the Giant Peach is a book. I'm thinking of the movie. Oh, I'm lost in my own thoughts. Let's just carry on. Peaches, 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 peaches. And it seems that any reference to color is no longer considered inappropriate. A shocked Matilda no longer turns white. She instead turns quite pale. I don't understand. This isn't necessary. A worm from James and the Giant Peach no longer has lovely pink skin. He now has lovely smooth skin. I don't understand. There are people and they are different colors. It doesn't make them any lesser or better or anything like that, but it doesn't mean they don't exist. It doesn't mean that it's not... I don't know, I feel like I can't comment on this being like the super whitest dude ever, but it's like, it, I don't know. How do people feel about that? Daddy, chill. And the terrible tractors from Fantastic Mr. Fox used to be painted black, but now their color is left up to the reader's imagination. I don't know, this, it's not... This is very weird. What the f is this? The list goes on and on, but they don't always appear to make much sense or solve a problem. For example, while Augustus Gloop may no longer be described as fat, his entire story arc still revolves around him being a greedy, overweight character is mocked and hated by the others for his girth. <laughs> Wait, so you're left in- a, you removed a descriptor of fat, but you're left in the part that is inappropriate, where people are making fun of him because he's overweight. What's going on? <laughs> this just makes no sense, Puffin. Great job. I, I think this just it doesn't make sense. The Oompa Loompas still sing a lengthy song about him, which describe him as utterly vile and welcomes the fact that he's just been sucked up by a chocolate pipe. And another thing, Roald Dahl's children books are known for their deliciously dark and rebellious theme. themes. They're a million miles away from the picnics and jolly hockey sticks of the Enid Blyton world. For example, George's Marvelous Medicine features a boy who concocts a new medicine for his grumpy grandma using such ingredients as engine oil and antifreeze. The book concludes with George effectively murdering his grandma by shrinking her out of existence but the rest of the family doesn't mind as she was becoming a bit of a nuisance <laughs> oh this video is wild i'm not suggesting that this needs to be banned as it's just an example of roald Dahl's wicked sense of humor but it's weird how puffin doesn't have a problem with publishing a children's book in which a young boy rustles up poisonous ingredients in the kitchen to polish off his grandma and yet any description of the ga grandma having a hairy face or something would be deemed crossing the line barely anyone <laughs> seemed to agree with the revisions people on the right were screaming about woke culture gone mad people on the left were screaming about protecting literary classics from clumsy censorship i feel like i'm, I'm in the middle and it's just like this is silly it's just like this is silly i'm not i don't it's not about protecting literary classics it's definitely not about wokeness gone mad it's just like this feels a bit unnecessary <laughs> why are we doing this oh no the tractors they're black <laughs> it's a f***ing tractor <laughs> Salman Rushdie declared the Puffin books and the Dahl estate should be ashamed of themselves but the absurd censorship. It was decent of them to him to speak out. During the height of the Satanic Versus controversy, Dahl was critical of Rushdie's work and branded him a dangerous opportunist who had a moral obligation to apply a modicum of censorship to his own work. Steady on, Dahl. <laughs> Steady on. Oh, we're, while we're on the subject, there's no doubt that Dahl could be a total bellend in real life. He was a self-confessed anti-Semite who once noted of the Jewish people, even a stinker like Hitler didn't pick them for no reason. No, he didn't. Oh, Dahl. Come on. No. Oh, Dahl. That really makes me lo li like you less. I mean, <laughs> to nobody's surprise. <laughs> Yet everyone from Prime Minister Rishi Sunak to Queen Consort Camilla was still queuing up to speak out against the censorship of the books. If you were to believe certain segments from the British press, it was Camilla's intervention which ultimately prompted a rethink from Puffin. I'm just trying to think if there's anyone whiter than Camilla. <laughs> I, I mean, I hesitate to comment on these things because I'm, I'm well aware that I'm super white. But Puffin's like, oh, we better listen to Camilla. <laughs> She's at least 10 times whiter than me! And I'm not saying that that means that white people can't have opinions on this stuff, but, I mean, when we're talking about, like, you know, slavery and stuff, it's obviously different, isn't it? So, <laughs> Simon, you're gonna, somewhere you're gonna accidentally get yourself in trouble, aren't you? Jesus Christ. Shortly after she made her views very clear, Puffin released a statement which announced they had listened to the debate and they had now decided to release a classic collection of unedited Dahl books alongside the newly revised versions. 
Thank you, Camilla. <laughs> but it does make you wonder what prompted all of this in the first place. One theory relates to Netflix's 2021 acquisition of the Roald Dahl estate for a reported $686 million. Oh my good lordy lord. That is a lot. That is a lot. And he's been dead for ages. The streaming service now plans to produce several new ad- I, Oh my god, I just can't get over how much they just spent on that. It's fucking mental. Who owned that before? Was it the Doll family or something? God damn. Can you imagine being like so successful that there's just $686 million being sold off like 20, 30 years after you died? Fuck me. I need- I got some work to do, son. Uh, this is awkward. Just pretend he doesn't exist. Oh, Jesus. Why is he just standing there staring at us? Can't he take a fucking hint already? The streaming service now plans to produce several new adaptations of Dahl's work, and it could be the case that they are attempting to sanitize the brand to avoid any future controversies. But I have another suggestion over the reasoning for this curious censorship storm and why it almost immediately led to copycat revisions from other publishers, including the owners of the literary copyright to James Bond. But first, a sidestep into a different medium for one of the weirdest revisions of all time, which took place much earlier in a galaxy far, far away, lost in space. I've never seen the original version of Star Wars. I know people often say that in, a misgu in the misguided belief that it makes them sound more interesting. It's right up there with pretending to hate the Beatles. Ah, uh, <laughs> I'm not a particular fan. The Beatles made some great music. I don't think it's... I, I don't not... Just... <laughs> the Beatles were really good. I, I have seen Star Wars. I just don't like it. I've seen like one or two of the original ones. Didn't like it. It's not for me. I saw like one or two of the new ones. Didn't like it. It's not for me. But I should clarify what I mean. I've never seen the original 1977 theatrical version of Star Wars. Oh, I didn't even know that existed. And there's a good chance that you haven't either. George Lucas first started tinkering around with the original film shortly after its release, and this was really ramped up during the 1997 special edition cut in which he spent around a third of the film's original budget. He continued to muck around with all three films in the original trilogy for years afterwards, right up until he sold the property to Disney in 2012. Most of the changes involved the addition of swishy new CGI effects, which weren't possible at the time of the film's original original release. AI upscaling and stuff is gonna make some old movies awesome, right? We're gonna be able to watch like old TV shows in like 4K, in like 16x9, rather than like, you know, the square grainy crap that we have to put up with today. But there are a long list of more controversial updates, including the superfluous introduction of Jabba the Hutt two films early, a scene in which Darth Vader screams like a big girl, and of course the reworking of a scene in which Han Solo is seen to shoot Greedo in self-defense, even though the smuggler clearly shot first in the original cut and edit, which arguably changes the moral ambiguity of the whole character. Oh my god, I don't care. But there's something deeply unusual about the later George Lucas revisions. While it's common for a popular movie to get a special extended cut or director's cut much later down the line, viewers can still usually opt to see the original theatrical cut, but not so with Star Wars. These new special editions have effectively overwritten the original. You'll never see the original version broadcast or streamed or legally available to buy today. A 2006 DVD box set claims to include the theatrical versions buried deep within the special features, but they're not technically the original versions, and they're presented in terrible quality anyway. You've lied to me. How many other lies have I been told by the council? Any cinema which attempts to show the original prints usually ends up getting their film reels confiscated. Holy sh George. Were they really that bad? George Lucas really doesn't want you to see them. In his defense, George Lucas claims that the original theatrical cut was a half-finished movie, whereas the special edition is the film he originally envisaged. But it does seem odd that you can no longer enjoy the original groundbreaking version in all its clunky 1970s glory, and instead you have to make do with what feels like a 1990s movie. Yeah, yeah, you could do that. Or, um, you could sail the high seas. Not that I'd ever endorsed whatever sailing the high seas means. And whilst the original movie won seven Academy Awards, including Best Visual Effects and Best Production Design, these triumphs are no longer reflected in the updated material of the only version that you're illegally allowed to watch. While Star Wars may have been one of the most important films of the 20th century, right up there with All Dogs Go to Heaven, Never heard of it, don't know what it is. I mean, I feel like I've heard of it, probably only because Danny's mentioned it before. It's strange to think anyone under the age of about 45 is unlikely to ever actually seen it, for your eyes only. Just as the Roald Dahl controversy begins to die down, new ones began to pop up, and uh, everyone was suitably annoyed. The Goosebump series of children's books. I loved those when I was a kid. R.L. Stein. Mm. There was one, I always remember that, Say Cheese and Die. 
There was, I think this was the first one I read. It really stuck with me. It's about this like Polaroid camera that they'd take a picture of something and it would show something horrible happening to them. And then later that horrible thing would happen. It's a f***ing like scary sh for an eight year old. First released in 1992, they're now undergoing heavy edits along the same lines as Roald Dahl revisions to remove any potentially offensive descriptions of characters. But the Ian Fleming estate has decided that the grown ups need protecting too, as future editions of James Bond books are also being censored, sorry, updated to impose modern values on vintage text. The problem is, but we're adults, we're adults reading this. We know about the past. We've, we've, we're aware of that existing. The problem is that the proposed revisions don't entirely add up, particularly when compared to the Bond material that apparently won't be tipex from history. The liberal use of the N-word in the early books will now be completely removed, but it now seems unacceptable to even mention the skin color of a minor black character. A barman, a doctor, a henchman, and an immigration officer all used to have dark skin in the original text. If they were all service jobs, or like, or, but one of them is a doctor. <laughs> Can't be having that. <laughs> but all of this has been removed. Yet it's still okay for Bond to describe Goldfinger's Korean henchman odd job as being like any other Korean, Korean, rather lower than apes in the mammalian hierarchy. Fuck me. How is that left in? But you can't have a black doctor. That seems insane. A not particularly racy scene set in a New York strip club in Live and Let Die, which compares the punters to grunting pigs at the trough, has been heavily cut. Why? And yet other segments in the Bond series remain intact, including a sequence in which Bond ponders over the sweepest sweet tang of rape and suggests homosexuality tendencies are a stubborn, are a stubborn disability. But pigs in the trough at a strip club is not okay. But it's like, oh, homosexuals, that stubborn disability. Good morning. Morning to you. Why are you gay? Again, I'm not necessarily suggesting revision of this material. The books reflect the racism, sexism, homophobia, and imperialist attitudes of the time. And surely it's more enlightening to deal with history instead of rewriting it or pretending that the bad stuff never happened. But it's the scattergun approach to the revisions, which makes you wonder how much thought was really put into this, why publishers seem keen to implement changes that nobody is asking for, and what exactly is the ultimate goal. Consider this, the forthcoming unedited classic collection, reprints of Roald Dahl, are now likely to sell Charlie bucket loads. Roald Dahl probably never enjoyed so much publicity in his lifetime. Could it be that the publishers were deliberately sparking up a fake controversy to get everyone ranting and raving over nothing at all in a bid to drum up publicity for the unedited versions they always plan to publish? And with James Bond copyright due to enter the public domain in 2034, could it be that the Ian Fleming estate is following suit in a largely devious last push to sell new unedited reprints? Maybe I'm being a little that would be kind of clever and sly. <laughs> That's kind of genius. No such thing as bad press, right? Maybe I'm being a little cynical, but I suspect that the publishers are taking the public and the media for a ride and here we are playing that sweet tune for them and after counting up the profits from this shifty endeavor they're the ones who like to be celebrating with lashings and lashings of ginger beer thank you for watching we just had like minus house points <laughs> <laughs> Credits and debits. 400 kajillion billion points from Gryffindor.